Good evening. Uh, I'm Mike Wallace on behalf of the Gotham Center and Suzanne Wasserman, the director of the center. Uh, welcome to the latest in our current string of uh, presentations. Uh, to let you know, the next forum is going to be on April 8th at 6.30 downstairs in the Proshansky Theater. And Sam Roberts, the New York uh, go-to guy on the New York Times, is going to be speaking about his new book, A History of New York and 101 Objects. Sam tells the history of America's great metropolis through 101 objects, combining the iconic, the unusual, and the scrumptious. Mastodon tusks, oysters, wooden water barrels, elevator brakes, checker calves, black and white cookies, and a fascinating look at the items that he believes epitomize the Big Apple. Inspired by a history of the world and 101 objects, Robert's new book collects the 50 articles he wrote for the New York Times, plus the added suggestions of readers, unique and whimsical. It's a chronicle that will rekindle memories and enrich your mind. You have to register for the event, even though it's free and open to the public. So to do that, you have to go to the Gotham Center website, gothamcenter.org slash forums slash current. Um, it'll be apparent when you get there. Now, tonight, um, we have uh, two speakers. Uh, and co-discussants of the question about the history of the progressive movement, the progressive era, what, if any, its uh, lessons are for today's activists and citizens. Uh, and in the order in which they'll chat, uh, for about 10, 15 minutes each, uh, and then we'll go to some conversation between the two, uh, and then we'll open the floor to uh, questions and comments. Uh, afterwards, just to give you advance notice, you'll have the opportunity of buying the two books that are the basis of what their presentations are just at the table outside on a special discount for you folks only. Joseph Varga is Assistant Professor of Labor Studies at Indiana University. He teaches courses in labor history, the function of unions in the US economy, and the globalization of labor markets. His current research involves the relationship between deindustrialization and working class culture and politics in the Midwest. He is working on his second book, An Exploration of the Emergence of the Precariat in the Post-2008 Economic System. Before receiving his doctorate from the New School for Social Research, Joe was a truck driver, forklift operator, and service worker, among other things. He's a longtime labor activist and a former Teamster shop steward and has worked for the IBEW and the New York State Working Families Party. David Hewson has taught U.S. history at Yale, where he received his Ph.D. in 2011, as well as at the New School's Eugene Lang College and Wesleyan. He is currently filling in for Kim Phillips Fine, teaching the history of capitalism and reform at the NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Study. His first book won Yale's Stephen Vella Prize as a dissertation and was written with fellowship support from the Mrs. Giles Whiting Foundation, the Tobin Project on Democracy and Markets, and a Schwartz postdoctoral fellowship at the New York Historical Society. I'm also married to a union organizer, just to hmm? get... <laughs> uh, uh, we will start with Joe. All right. Thanks. I have pictures. I never go anywhere anymore without pictures. Maybe we should 
Uh, are we in the line? Of... No, it's... Yeah. We're not blocking the... No, no, I don't think, I don't think so. We are. Our heads are not silhouetted. Our heads, heads are not silhouetted. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Ooh, we got we, now we have mood and everything. All right. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Thanks, David, for being here, and thanks to the Gotham Center uh, for putting this event together, and everybody, Susan, and everybody else who was involved. And thanks to Monthly Review Press for having faith in my work and publishing my book, uh, which is available in the lobby. Um, so it's kind of odd for me and ironic that I'm here at the Gotham Center for New York History at a panel on the progressive era reconsidered, talking about my own work called Hell's Kitchen and the Battle for Urban Space with a date, 1894 to 1914, and yet, when I was writing this work and I was doing the research, I insisted to anybody who would listen, and some of you are here and had to listen, um, that I was not writing another history of New York City. This was not a history of the progressive era. It certainly wasn't a history of the progressive era reformers. I, and I insisted on that to anybody who would listen, and yet here I am. Because at a certain <laughs> point, you have to kind of give in and say, yeah, okay, fine. It's a history of the progressive era. It's a his history of the reformers. But there is a point to that. Uh, and part of the point was um, I was arrogant at the time that I started the work, and I'm a little less arrogant now. I kind of followed where the research took me and the more I've researched into urban history, urban theory, urban processes, uh, honestly, the more humble I've become about what we can actually know about how urban processes work, and particularly about uh, the history of urban reform. So I'm humbled by my, our lack of knowledge, but I also wanted to, uh, in that regard, uh, try to do something different. And so uh, we were talking about uh, Oz Frankel before, who was my advisor in the history department over at the New School. And I remember my first conversation with Oz about this project, and I said, this is no box of dusty letters that have been sitting around in some archive in a library. This is new history. This is gonna be something different. And I wanted to do something, something different. I did not want to do an intellectual history of the progressives. I did not want to do a political history of mayors and aldermen. Uh, what I wanted to do, because I'm also a sociologist, and my PhD is in sociology, um, and I really study urban theory, is I really wanted to come up with an urban theory of failure. Uh, what I really wanted to know was why do so many projects that attempt to reform or ameliorate or alleviate uh, poverty conditions in what we've come to term slums, why they all seem to fail. Uh, in one way or another, and why they consistently fail over time in the modern capitalist industrial era. So what I wanted to do mostly was what the urban spatial theorist Edward Soya said, it urged us to do in his 1989 book, uh, Postmodern Geographies, is to take space seriously. And I really wanted to look at a new and different kind of archive. I wanted to look at the actual space itself, the built environment, the relationship between the built environment, uh, human intention, and the natural terrain, and look at that as a new archive for studying uh, urban history and urban theory. I also wanted to suggest ways of understanding failure to deepen our understanding of why efforts to alleviate or eliminate urban poverty always seem to fall short by including these non-human factors in my history. So I wanted to include how the space effects back on the human intentions of the human users and human actors and kind of alters their ways of seeing themselves and their own intentions. And finally, I wanted to counter standard narratives 
about solidarities and racial and ethnic identity, rather than reiterate existing and somewhat stale ideas about community and some over-romantic views of things like neighborhood, I wanted to look at how urban space itself can fragment those identities. And I tried to do all that in this book. Um, I hope I succeeded in some way or another. I'm not sure <coughs> if I did. So what I want to talk about very briefly, uh, uh, we're, we're here to try to talk about the progressive era, the lessons of history, and David has written some, some really great post-book blog posts on what we can learn from the progressive era and questioning that very notion of whether we actually learn any kind of lessons of history. And I want to deepen those questions and say, do we ever actually learn uh, from history? And so one of the things I, I've done recently is I saw a documentary and it was called Slums, Cities of Tomorrow. And it's an excellent documentary and I saw it on a film series about global human rights. And it's a French documentary and it looks at six different areas of the world where there are what we would call slums, what we would consider uh, entrenched urban poverty. And mostly this is looking at things like Br uh, Brazilian favelas. And that's a picture of a Brazilian favela. And that is also a picture on the right side of the latest in public housing, the latest ideas in public housing in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And so a couple of things about this documentary and the lessons of history. Uh, one is that this documentary suggested very strongly that we've not learned the lessons of history, that we're still trying to alleviate or ameliorate slum conditions by simply building new housing and concentrating poor people in those new slum conditions uh, without addressing the root issues uh, of the economic problems and the economic dislocation of large portions of this population. And the, the uh, documentary is suggesting, as I will suggest, that until we deal with those root problems, you're merely shifting the problem around and you're not actually paying attention to the way for instance, a Brazilian favela develops. And they mostly develop because there's that segment of population that is dislocated and kept out of the official economy and they survive by constructing an unofficial economy and unofficial housing uh, and doing things for themselves when either the state or the economic system won't perform those functions. So I don't think we've learned, we've quite absorbed those lessons yet of actually listening to people, of listening to poor people. But the, one, the other thing that I noticed about Cities of Tomorrow, as progressive as the documentary tries to be, it also still does the same thing. It kind of over-romanticizes the slum dweller, the noble poor person uh, who's battling against both the forces of the economy and the state. And those were, again, the, the types of things that I really did try to avoid in my own work. And I think that we're not avoiding in contemporary urban theory. So what I was trying to do with my work mostly was again, look at the space itself. And the space that I was working with uh, from 1894 to 1940, 1914 was the area known as Hell's Kitchen. And if you read the book, uh, I do deal with some of the history of where the name came from, how the area comes to be designated, and what I think one of the more fascinating things, we're talking about the area mainly from 34th Street to 54th Street, right below uh, Central Park and Riverside Park, 8th Avenue west to what was then called the North River. And there's a relationship between the geographic natural terrain and how this area develops. So the deep water ports were one key to this area. As you go further up the island, uh, the, the rock formations of the terrain on the, uh, on the shoreline are not conducive to the type of ports that will be developed in Hell's Kitchen. So you wind up with things like the slaughterhouses along 11th Avenue that are built there because ships are bringing in the cattle and they're being slaughtered in this area. Uh, the other thing is, is about the, you know, the grid work of Manhattan and the, uh, the, the, uh, the tenements that are constructed on the limited plots that were divided up to be sold to uh, real estate interests. So all of these things kind of contribute to the development of the slum. And what I tried to, again, tried to look at is uh, how the space itself is an actor in this area. And I don't want to talk for too long and I don't want to um, go over my time. But some of the things that I found, and we can talk about them in question and answer, uh, some of the things I found was this was uh, an early location of what David Harvey and other left geographers and left theorists have termed the spatial fix of capital. 
Uh, so there's this great book uh, that has become a keystone of the work I'm doing now in the Midwest. It's called Capital Moves, uh, written by uh, Cornell scholar Jeff Cowie. And Cowie talks about how long before the era of contemporary globalization, you had the movement of capitalist firms from one location to another seeking what Harvey calls the spatial fix. And the spatial fix is basically when a firm invests in fixed capital in one location, and that one location becomes so expensive for them because of that fixed capital that their rate of profit starts to fall and they have to seek a spatial fix by moving to another location. And for Hell's Kitchen, one of the big moves in the period that I studied was a company called Higgins Carpet, and they did exactly this in 1901. They found that their costs of labor, their costs of water, their costs for utilities, were rising and affecting their ability to turn profit. So they wind up moving to Connecticut and actually trying to form a company town in Connecticut. And they try to bring some of the weavers and the rug workers with them. And it doesn't turn out well. And in fact, most of them move, end up moving back to Hell's Kitchen to work in New York. But it's an early example of, again, what Harvey calls the spatial fix happening you know, 80 years before our contemporary era, era of globalization. So that is labor geography. That's how capitalist investment affects what people do, what kind of jobs they can get, what kind of wages they can uh, make. What I tried to look at in this work was also the geography of labor, how workers themselves will alter space uh, to further their own needs and their own desires and, you know, kind of take care of themselves within an unfair, uh, economic, unequal economic system. And I found numerous examples of that. Uh, and that actually affects the way that urban reformers work and, and affects what they can do. And I wanted to talk about, and very briefly, um, three examples of why some of the fixes that the urban reformers tried to install uh, failed during this period. So the pictures I have here, the one on the left is of 11th Avenue, the Avenue of Death. And basically in 1900, it was one of the most congested areas of New York City. In fact, I have some statistics in the book, it may have been the most congested area of New York City. And down the middle of the street, you see there's a freight train running down the middle of the street. So you have these kids who lived in these tenements on either side of 11th Avenue. Their playground basically was the street, was 11th Avenue, and right through the middle of their playground, a freight train that went from 20 to 30 miles an hour down the middle of 11th Avenue. So that's how it developed its nickname, the Avenue of Death, because literally little kids would run across the street, they would try to jump over the train, they'd fall, they'd get sliced in half. And it, it was, you know, a situation that we certainly would not put up with today. Uh, the other thing, one of the other things I write about, it's a policeman on the corner with a member of the sanitation department. In chapter three of the book, I write about uh, the history of policing during this period. And those are, uh, it's one of the examples that I want to talk about here briefly. The three examples I want to talk about is DeWitt Clinton Park, model tenements, and policing frozen zones. And I'll try to, again, try to do this very quickly. Um, DeWitt Clinton Park, a great example of the efforts of urban reformers. So it's still there. It's still up on uh, 10th Street. I, I may not get the streets right, around 46th. Um, it's still up uh, in, in Hell's Kitchen. Um, but it took over 30 years of advocacy for to get this park built. And it finally gets built around 1905. And I deal with it in the book, uh, the efforts to get it built. It finally gets built, and the people who built it, they're urban reformers, they're progressives. Um, they're wondering why the teenagers in the area aren't using the park, and why they seem to be angry, and why they seem to be at, you know, engaging in act of vandal acts of vandalism. And what the people who built the park didn't realize was that by building the park, they were actually destroying what was considered a lover's lane that ran between part of this abandoned uh, field where the park gets built and a factory, and it's where the local kids went to have sex because they couldn't have sex in the tenements because everybody, you know, people were living on top of each other. So they were angry that their lover's lane was taken away and they weren't using the park. And it's again, it's one of the ways that if you don't get feedback from your population for efforts like that, they're going to in part fail. So that kind of tin ear of the reformers was one reason for the failure. The other one that I talk about a little bit, at least in the book, was the construction of model tenements. And these were supposed to be improved tenement houses that were going to offer modern amenities 
and you had to apply to get into them, you had to meet certain uh, income requirements, you had to have a clean record, and after a while, several of the model tenements, uh, none of the people, none of the working class people of Hell's Kitchen are moving into them, and people are wondering why, and there's, it's, it's actually people of a little higher income bracket that are moving into them, and what they didn't realize was that uh, so many people made extra money by using their tenement apartments for unofficial purposes. Uh, to run unofficial taverns, what were called shabines, uh, unofficial uh, taking in laundry uh, and doing them in the apartments. And that was some, one of, some of the things you weren't allowed to do in the new model tenements. And again, it's not paying attention to your population and kind of imposing these uh, fixes from above that leads to, at least in part, to the failure. And so finally, the, the final thing that I want to talk about, and this was one of the most exciting things that I found in my research, was how the space of a city can fragment those identities that we think of as urban solidarities. And in chapter three, I describe what we would call today a police riot. And it starts you know, typically with the accusation uh, that an African-American woman is engaging in prostitution. And a detective tries to arrest her. Her husband sees this going on and stabs him, thinking that she's being assaulted. And two days later, during his funeral, um, the, the residents of Hell's Kitchen, the white residents, uh, start engaging in rioting against the black population, which was concentrated in a particular area in the lower 50s, what was called San Juan Hill. And after a day of rioting, uh, they're, they're more emboldened. They're chasing down African Americans in the street. A lot of people are getting injured. There's a mayoral race going on, and, and the alderman decides that he can't have this in the area, and he orders the police to break up this rioting. And most of the police are white Irish ethnics, and most of the rioters are white Irish ethnics, and the rioting white Irish ethnics cannot understand why suddenly their police department has turned on them. Um, and so this breaks up that racial and ethnic solidarity that had developed in the neighborhoods uh, based on a different type of need from that space, the need to police that space and make it look like it was part of the reform movement and a space that no longer had this type of rioting. So it's the way that these, these uh, processes work to break up those uh, racial and ethnic solidarities that I was really interested in and I hope I showed in some way or another uh, in the work. So. That's what I tried to do with this work. Whether we learn from history or not, um, I think that's an open question. These are two pictures that I uh, pulled off of a website of one of my favorite architects. Uh, it's a guy named Teddy Cruz, and he works along the Mexico-US border, and he studies informal communities where people creatively reuse materials that they find that have you know, kind of uh, either been discarded or are taken from other structures. And he's using these kind of models to construct his own architectural models uh, containing this kind of openness and creative reuse. So I'm not sure if we learn lessons from history, but what I do think is that uh, there is a slow sedimentation of knowledge over time that interacts with our positions in the world of physical objects to allow for different ways of being and knowing to emerge. And I think things like uh, Teddy Cruz's architecture are an example of that. I'm not sure if Teddy Cruz and his architectural teams have learned from history, but we do have sedimented knowledge about what happens when you ignore the needs of a local population, uh, what happens when you try to impose top-down improvements rather than uh, going from the bottom up. And I think one of the things that we can actually learn from history is, is um, there's a temptation to say, and I think David, uh, your work engages this as well, to say that there is a kind of deafness, there is a kind of wall between reformers who are of a certain class and people who live in these neighborhoods who are of another class, and that if you don't listen to them, you know, you're gonna have that level of disconnect. But I, I don't wanna use something like that to advocate for neoliberal market approaches mm -hmm. to urban gentrification. What I do want to say is that any effort to improve urban conditions is going to contain a degree of failure. And if you don't, if you, you have to accept that degree of failure if you're going to undertake any kind of projects like this. Um, so I want to end there and, and uh, say I hope we, we can learn that lesson at the very least. Thanks.
Hi there. I just want to reiterate Joe's thanks to uh, the Gotham Center, to Mike and Suzanne for putting this all together. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I thought I'd start um, just with a quick reading from uh, a small section of my book to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of stories that I tell. So this is from the first chapter called Invading the Tenements. Just before dawn on May 31st, 1894, Solomon Kleinrock's liquor store at 129 Suffolk Street exploded. The flames flew down the tenement hallways in a deadly rush, climbing stairwells and licking at lintels, writhing under doors. The blast had reverberated through, rickety old, through the rickety old house, startling Peter Rutz from sleep in his third floor apartment bed. Rutz went to his door to find the source of the commotion. The minute I opened the door, he later recounted, I was blinded with smoke and dirt and blaze. I was chucked right clean back on the floor and my wife commenced to holler and the children came running out of the bedroom. Rutz slammed the door shut, but the apartment was already filling with smoke as the fire gathered strength. I saw the flames bursting through the floors, Rutz said. I got them right in my face. Rutz and his wife rushed to save their sons, struggling past obstructions on the fire escape as they frantically pushed the children out of the doomed tenement. Finally, Rutz turned back for his four-year-old niece, Lizzie Yeager, still in a side bedroom. When I went to go in for her, he explained why the flame was away over my head already. Couldn't get in anymore. Helpless against the heat and choking on smoke, Rutz was forced to flee without the girl. The next time he saw his niece, quote, I saw her on the sidewalk right after the fireman got her out. She was lying on a pillow. She was just like all swollen up. I looked at her, saw her face. The firemen had been battling another blaze in Broom Street when the Suffolk Street alarm went out, fatally lengthening their response. And by the time they discovered Lizzie in Rutz's rooms, the girl was horribly burned. She died at Gouverneur Hospital a few hours later. When her father, Charles Yeager, came to see her body in the hospital the next day, he recalled, I hardly knowed her. It is unlikely that Richard Watson Gilder, poet, club man, and editor of arguably the most influential English language literary journal, of the day, the century, would have taken notice of Lizzie's death under ordinary circumstances. Only by seeming accident of fate did the worlds of the poor doomed child and the successful refined literature collide. A few weeks earlier, the New York state and city governments had initiated a program to reform the tenements, and Governor Roswell P. Flower had appointed Gilder to the, as the chair of the Tenement House Committee of 1894. Gilder was a devout Christian an obsessive worker and a civil service reform advocate who abhorred corruption of any kind. He would not be derelict in his duties to the tenements. In the first of what would be several such investigations, he rushed to the scene of Lizzie's death as soon as he heard of the fire, anxious to play his role in bettering the lives of less eminent New Yorkers. The visit launched a cross-class reform project that would consume him for over a year and have him waiting, quote, heart deep in misery all summer long. The same year that Gilder waited in misery, his good friend, Stanford White, was overseeing a signature construction project in the same neighborhood. White, an interior designer, architect, and New York Society bon vivant, had recently enjoyed a triumph at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. The agricultural building designed by his firm, McKim, Mead, and White, had received prime placement in the fair's court of honor. The building's neoclassical grandeur, sparkling white facade, and gorgeously sculpted pediments provided a consummate aesthetic symbol of America's industrial prowess and imperial ambition. As the article in Scientific American gushed, the glory of the exposition is the court of honor, and the glory of the court of honor is the agricultural building. The fairgrounds layout reflected the reigning spirit of a powerful, expanding United States at the center of the world, surrounded by exhibits depicting exoticized visions of foreign cultures prostrate before America. It is no wonder that when the Bowery Savings Bank commissioned McKim, Mead, and White that same year to design a structure stretching from Elizabeth Street to the Bowery across Grand Street, White's creative impulses returned to the themes of the agricultural building. It was the perfect vision to construct in more permanent form on the Lower East Side of New York, an emblem of American promise at the epicenter of poor, unassimilated foreigners, the literal crossroads of the Irish, Italian, German, and Russian immigrant communities. 
Within limits determined by the constraint setting on the Bowery, White's design for the bank's exterior, particularly the Bowery and Grand Street facades, which are still there for those of you who have seen them or would like to look, mirrored the agricultural building. He used many of the same artists, friends, and aesthetic collaborators for the stonework. Construction lasted from 1893 to 1895, and the result endures as a historic landmark today. That its marble magnificence sprang up surrounded by slums in the midst of the worst economic calamity the United States has ever known has been almost completely forgotten. So the reason that I wanted to start with that reading was to just give you this flavor of the kinds of stories that I tell about the progressive era, and they're really sustained attention, they are a, a, an articulation of sustained attention to cross-class encounters, where the wealthy and the workers encounter each other in some form of quotidian life. And what I find through these stories uh, very frequently is that the progressive era, this period that, you know, as the traditional historiography imagines it, is most associated with dramatic progress and reform in American history, uh, in fact, is something else, has these records of failure, of uh, failure embedded in the reforms that are often championed and telescoped forward to the New Deal as regulatory innovation that somehow predicts or creates the foundation for uh, the improvements of the mid-20th century in terms of class relations. Um, and one of the things that I see in these stories, just taking Gilder as an example, is that he, he, he has wonderful intentions in terms of going into the tenements and improving lives for working class New Yorkers. But the inspectors that he chooses for his committee's team, uh, their racial and class biases often cause them to barge into tenement residents' homes and disrupt them, as one tenement resident says to the hearing committee um, that, the, that they set up later that, later that year in 1894. They have no sense of the delicacy of the poor going in and out of certain rooms. And this is something that, that describes a certain kind of class interaction that I see pervading the progressive era, something that I call prescriptive class relations, wherein bourgeois individuals or groups attempt to prescribe or choreograph behavior to the working class with a minimum of violence, often in dramatic, spectacular fashion. Uh, the opening anecdote of the book is a story of the Salvation Army's Christmas dinner of 1899, in which Wealthy New Yorkers uh, were sold tickets for a dollar to come to Madison Square Garden and sit in the mezzanine and watch New York's poor eat their Christmas meal on the arena floor. Uh, this sort of thing was, this sort of charity was dependent on the poor's conforming to certain sorts of expectations of appropriate behavior. And indeed, when certain of New York's poor decided to go outside of Madison Square Garden and set up impromptu poultry markets with the, the charity chickens that they had received from the Salvation Army, police came by and beat them away and told, told them, you know, you ungrateful wretches, what are you doing on the street trying to, to make hay out of, uh, out of this, this charity that's been so beneficently given to you by the Salvation Army? Now, I do think that some progressive efforts that I talk about, some stories that I tell, represent a different kind of interaction between wealthy and the working class. And those I, I talk about as cooperative class relations, wherein there is some evidence of mutual respect across class lines. Um, often what I find, however, is that in instances such as I talk about Jacob, Reese's philanth uh, Jacob Schiff's philanthropy um, as an example of this and how it was really driven by his own sense of devotion to uh, tzedakah, the, the Jewish spirit of charity, um, he, which decrees that you have to actually engage with the objects of your, of your philanthropy directly as human beings. Um, and he does this not only on his own, but through Lillian Wald and the Henry Street Settlement, which uh, really exemplified a certain kind of attempt to create mutual respect across class lines. And that certainly can't be said for, for all of the settlements of this period. But what I found, even in many of these cooperative interactions, was that certain structures of power to, interfered with the ability of either, uh, you know, in, in Schiff and Wald's case, in Schiff's case, uh, uh, the sort of religious element of his philanthropy and his own Judaism created boundaries between him and other reformers who were attempting to do similar work. And one of the stories I tell is of an exchange of letters between him and Jacob Rees, who of course is the, the reformer par excellence for the early period of the Progressive Era, wherein Rees writes to him asking for a donation for a non-sectarian cause, but he appeals to him as a Jew, saying that the, the 
uh, gymnasium that he wants money for has been serving more and more Jews lately. And Schiff writes back to him and offers a check of $500, and, but says politely in his letter, you really shouldn't be asking me as a Jew because this is non-sectarian and I've never heard of any Gentile being asked for a donation on the basis that Christian children are being served in a non-sectarian institution. Well, Reese writes back in high dudgeon uh, and uh, just sort of delivers this uh, anti-Semitic tirade in which he says, it's not worth it for me to ask, ask, uh, for, ask Jews for money. I'm not gonna do it anymore. You, you know, you're, you, you, and it's not evidence of bigness in a Jew to refuse to uh, give money to a, a cause that supports his people. So there's this kind of different evaluation, a, a religiously intolerant evaluation of the kind of spirit of mutual respect that uh, Schiff was trying to create. And from Wald's perspective, you had a situation where her settlement, the Henry Street settlement, was of course beholden to wealthy philanthropists whose political and ideolog ideological commitments made them a little bit wary of Wald's own sort of dalliance with occasional radicalism, including socialism and uh, ultimately during World War I, the anti-war movement. And she lost a lot of donors. And it also took a long time for the municipal government of New York City, beholden as it was to its own ideology of liberal development, lib classically liberal economic development. Uh, to actually invest in the Henry Street settlement, even though the settlement and the nurses' service, uh, the visiting nurses' service, which Wald created out of the settlement beginning in 1893, uh, those services had performed functions in New York City of social work and of medical services to working class populations that the city's own infrastructure was not delivering in any comparable measure. So even the cooperative elements of reform often uh, face these structures of power, whether they be religious intolerance or uh, the necessary material considerations um, that are freighted with, with political implications that prevented them from actually making the kind of impact that they could. Now finally, there is of course conflict in this period. And I think conflict has only really recently over the last few decades become a, a kind of major center of progressive era historiography's attention. And one of the stories that I tell in this book as well, and one of my favorite stories is uh, the, about the strikes, uh, the transit strikes in New York City of 1916. How many, how many of you knew that there were transit strikes in 1916 in New York City? Okay, so a smattering of hands. This is something that the newspapers at the time described as a civil war in the streets of New York. You had residents of uh, the neighborhood that Joe talks about throwing bricks and bottles and, you know, according to some reports, actually shooting guns at elevated trains that were passing through Hell's Kitchen that were being operated by strike breakers. Um, and in one of my favorite episodes from this, from this strike, uh, Mary Harris, Mother Jones, delivers a speech to uh, strikers' wives in an Upper East Side uh, theater in which she says, you ought to be out raising hell. This is the fighting age. Put on your fighting clothes. America was not discovered by Columbus for that bunch of blood-sucking leeches who are now living off of us. You are too sentimental. These women then proceeded to go out onto the street and about 200 of them, according to reports in the newspaper, rip apart a strike breaker operated trolley car with their bare hands, with bricks, with stones, and attack police officers. Now, interestingly enough, the police decided not to arrest Mother Jones in the aftermath of this because, as the police matron put it, she did not say anything of an inflammatory nature. Um, but you can see how, in some respects, that anecdote describes a level of conflict that was accepted as part of the political landscape of the progressive era between workers and the wealthy. And I think one of the transformations that you see in this period is that um, that kind of conflict, that kind of violence in attempting to rectify some measure of injustice across class lines becomes impossible to imagine. And certainly, I think comparable violence today in, in New York City, given the militarization of the police force, is, is totally unimaginable. Um, I'd love to be corrected if I'm, if I'm wrong. But, uh, but I think that, that one of the reasons that I wanted to tell these stories was to show that these folks who these days are calling for a new progressive era to address contemporary inequality, people like Robert Reich and Doris Kearns Goodwin and Jeffrey Sachs, really need to understand the period that they're looking at a bit more 
in a bit more of a sophisticated light to understand that there is not only this degree of failure, but actually a legacy of uh, class animosity and repression of true class cooperation that we still, whose, whose reproduction we still live with today. Um, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit more with Joe and uh, during the Q&A. So thank you. Let's see. Let me uh, start as a, an icebreaker, sort of up up the altitude for a second. Um, Steve Fraser has a new book out uh, called The Age of Acquiescence, which I confess not to have read, but Kim Phillips Fine did a splendid uh, analytical piece on it, and another book by Gohagen on um, both of which are looking back at this period fondly in comparison to the absence of political protest, outrage, uh, the collapse of the union movement. Uh, I mean, they seem to advance a variety of arguments about why that's the case, uh, and it's a long and con complex uh, history. Um, but I'm wondering why, if in fact on close inspection, and both of your books are terrific, uh, close, analytical, sensitive to um, uh, subtleties, but pulling the camera back just a little bit, why is it that, in retrospect, uh, the boiling cauldron of the era uh, looks so good? Uh, <laughs> uh, what were the what were the real successes? I mean, I don't think any success right. in politics, in fact, lasts forever. And you, so you can look at the response to the Triangle Fire and the passage of a whole sequence of legislation is demanding the water sprinklers that are over our head uh, right now. Uh, the notion that there's ever any success that is permanent uh, is ludicrous. Uh, history can go backwards as well as it can go forwards. So one response is, well, there were some wins, but it's a matter of you know permanent revolution that is required, and we're back in some sense to where we were a uh, hundred years ago, uh, but arguably we're in a worse situation given the nature of the workforce, uh, given the nature of the economy, given global relations, et cetera, et cetera. Could you, maybe each of you in some way or another, speculate on the question of what, what arguably were the successes uh, that we can point to in addition to the, you know, the drawbacks and limitations that make it seem relatively, at least to the non-knowledgeable, uh, as appealing as it seems to. Well, I think oftentimes, you know, as Joe is, was suggesting in his comments, success is actually embedded in failure in some respect. And so, you know, one of the stories that I tell in the book is about the 1909 shirtwaist strike. Uh, of It was a general strike of shirtwaist workers in New York, which I'm sure many of you have read about or know about. Um, Ultimately, the strike did not succeed in winning union recognition for, uh, among other workers, the Triangle workers. And they were unable to negotiate over such matters as the locked doors on their floors that a year and a half later, or less than a year and a half later, would result in many of their deaths. Um, at the same time, that strike got between 20 and 40,000 workers out on the street experiencing collective power and collective activism, created alliances between the wealthy and the working class over issues of women's suffrage and forged this kind of feminist consciousness um, that ultimately carries forward and gains strength and is built upon uh, moving toward the passage of the 19th Amendment. And uh, the ILGWU, which this is not the sort of official history of the ILGWU, uh, they usually concentrate on the men's strike that happened the following year as the, the sort of touchstone or foundation of the building of that union, which becomes one of the most powerful unions in the 20th century uh, in New York City um, and does an amazing amount of good for working class lives uh, over the course of the century. The foundation for that union is the shirtwaist strike of 1909. Without that strike, you don't have the initial spark. Um, there were $4 in the locals' treasury 
when they began that strike and ultimately becomes a union of hundreds of thousands of workers um, and makes a gigantic difference in people's lives. So even though there is this measure of failure where the alliance of the strike falls apart in recrimination over whether or not the socialists helped more or the society New York ladies helped more, uh, whose politics were being prioritized, you still wind up with, with a, a lasting success that emerges from failure, even though you also have to face the, the murderousness of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire 13, 14 months later. Which I think is tomorrow, is the anniversary. 100, is tomorrow, yeah. 100 and, right, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Over. So I think at 11.30 they always have a, a memorial over in, on, in NYUville, as I always call it. <laughs> um, but going, going back to the, the labor question, uh, Anga Higgins' book and these calls for uh, a kind of uh, reinvigoration of the, the notion of the strike. Every strike before the National Labor Relations Act is, is, is in one way or another a failure, almost every one. Um, I'm waiting for somebody to write the book about the traction strikes between 1912 and 1917 hmm. because they happen, there is in just about every city in America as, as just a, in a, a kind of a mental survey there's some kind of streetcar strike during those years. Mm -hmm. And I was particularly thinking of 1913, where, where I'm at now. I, I'm always local and I always do uh, local research. 1913, there was a, a streetcar strike in Indianapolis and it was part of a wave that went from St. Louis to Indianapolis to Cincinnati. And <coughs> it was a violent strike, right? They, 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 not everybody participated. Some of the streetcar workers tried to work and, and actually operate the machines. And the people went out there and they knocked them over and they set them on fire, right? And this was the, the, the kind of way you did a strike. The people or the cars? The cars. Right. <laughs> a few people did get hurt. It's an important distinction though, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a few people did get hurt and what came out of that, so the strike was a failure. They didn't get, you know, they, they, they didn't get any budge in pay. This was over a pay cut. Uh, but what actually came of it were the first labor laws passed by the Indiana Assembly, and they were passed about two months after these guys, the guys, the guys and girls, they bought, they brought the city of Indianapolis to its knees. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, for two or three days around the elections of 1913, you couldn't go anywhere in the city uh, because of the strike. So, but a couple of things about that that are, you know, so are, are we going to do that today? Are we going to call for labor to reinvigorate itself and, you know, get out there on strike and burn some streetcars? Obviously, we're not going to do that. <laughs> One of the keys to that strike, and, and I think this is true Steve in a Fraser lot. Fraser is kind of doing that, isn't he? He is doing that, <laughs> and I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. Unless you want to have a lot of people in jail on charges of terrorism mm -hmm. and serving not you know, 30 days for uh, you right. know, a public demonstration, but serving 30 years in a federal penitentiary, mm -hmm. because that's the state that we live in today. One of the keys to that 1913 strike in Indianapolis is that the police actually picked a side, and in this case, they picked the side of the workers because that was the machine that was in charge of the city at the time uh, versus the governor of the state. Those are not our politics today. If you try to have a strike in downtown Indianapolis today, I don't think there's any way you could get the police on your side unless it was a police strike, right? So we live in a different security environment. And to say that we're going to revitalize labor and we're going to fight this, you know, this new austerity uh, by getting out in the streets and being like we were in 19, right. uh, 1913 is simply, um, I, I mean, it's utopian. It, it, it certainly calls for a reinvigoration of public <laughs> demonstration, like we're going to have on April 15th for fast food workers. Um, <laughs> Is, is something that we should be doing. Right. But we live in a different security state, and I don't think we were ever going to be able to replicate those conditions. I think there's another side to the nostalgia as well um, among some folks for the progressive era that has to do with the other side of the class spectrum, and, and that's the, the sort of quality of philanthropists that we enjoy today versus the, the wealthy of yesteryear, um, or at least how we, how we tend to imagine them. Um, you know, I think that they're there were, for whatever their faults uh, and the ideological blinders of their visions, there were wealthy people in the United States, very prominent wealthy people, who were grappling with the fact that the system of industrial capitalism that was making them incredibly wealthy seemed to be unsustainable. 
in terms of the levels of inequality, the levels of violence, both uh, direct and political violence, and just day-to-day -day industrial violence um, were wreaking on, on the United States. And they engaged with that question of how does capitalism need to change in order to survive? How do we need to put certain kinds of regulations in place or uh, certain kinds of structures, institutional structures in place that will offer some kind of respite from the levels of inequality that we have today and I th uh, that, that, that they had at the time. And I think today, you know, the most prominent brand of philanthropy is philanthrocapitalism. Um, it's this vision of giving charity to organizations that will be run like businesses and will uh, produce profit somehow while also doing social good. Um, there is a kind of desire to apply the principles of free market neoliberal capitalism to the act of giving or the act of engaging with the problems of contemporary society in class and political economic terms. And I think you wind up with this kind of, uh, there's a wonderful piece in, in uh, I don't know if it's in the paper current issue of Jacobin, um, it may actually just be online, but uh, it describes how George Soros, uh, who's part of this philanthrocapitalist vision, has uh, actually profited from the sort of destruction of one of the millennium villages in Africa that he was promoting and giving money to, uh, but it's been completely decimated by gold prospectors. And of course, he has made all this money off of the, the rise in the price of gold. He bet heavily on it over the last few years. And uh, so on, on the one hand, he's, he's giving to this village that is, you know, is supposed to be money that goes to all sorts of beneficial educational developments and infrastructural developments, providing water to people who don't have it. Um, and then ultimately, the, you know, what he gives with the one hand, he destroys with the other and actually earns money off of it. And I think that that kind of vision of, of philanthropy is a, a lot uglier than there's, there's another level, it seems to me, on which um, certain sectors of corporate capital worked in what gets called the progressive era. Uh, George Perkins, who was a uh, close associate of J.P. Morgan, uh, was also a high executive in the life insurance company, uh, was the principal funder of the Progressive Party uh, campaign that Teddy Roosevelt ran on for president in 1912. Uh, and there's an overlap that always strikes me as interesting between uh, progressive is such a fuzzy, wuzzy word. I mean, the whole movement and the historiography are so disheveled and <laughs> rambunctious, but... Um, an inescapable tautology. <laughs> one of the things that really has capital upset is, in fact, the market. I mean, we're in such a different world. I mean, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, um, and many, many, many others looked at the chaos that was uh, unleashed by competition, which drove down prices, which is a bad thing, which led to cutting wages for workers, which is possibly okay, but then they formed unions and socialist parties, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and this was a really bad thing. So the solution was to wring as much competition mm -hmm. out of the marketplace as you possibly could. I mean, ideally, by having a handful of gigantic companies, in fact, run everything. Uh, but if needs be, to bring in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the key entities, I mean, what Roosevelt does in 1912 is he brings together that segment of big capital with Morgan, in fact, you know, those people behind it. Uh, as well as the social welfare crowd, the people who say there must be structural alleviation, there must be where Europe was, of course, immensely ahead of what was going on in the United States. Let's bring in workman's compensation, let's bring in unemployment insurance, let's bring in X, Y, and Z that are already on the boards in, in, in Germany. What seems to give that movement energy is the fact that there's people to the left of that, who in fact are not on the boards uh, today. It seems that Fraser argues that one of the things that gave people the moral, political, cultural strength to resist what was happening in the corporate economy 
was the fact that at that point in U.S. history, you could still remember a time that was an artisanal, craftsman-based economy uh, where uh, workers uh, were not disposable cogs but were honored members of the community uh, uh, and, and the like. I'm, I'm not sure how true that is, uh, and I guess I'm more impressed with the, uh, for instance, Clara Lemlich, who is the woman who galvanizes the women's strike in 1909, uh, is a, uh, not a Bundist herself perhaps, but is one of a massive flood of uh, left-wing Russians and Eastern Europeans who are fresh from the battlefields of the revolution of 1905. Uh, and they arrive with a far more profound consciousness of what, what they're up against. So either between memories of what once was possible and new recruits who are staunchly anti-capitalist, you have to the left of the progressives uh, a potent force that scares the hell out of people uh, and leads to some positive uh, developments. How does that compare to our contemporary state of affairs? That's a long question, but, um, <laughs> but I, 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 it got me thinking of the term post-artisanal affect, because I'm, I'm currently writing a piece called Post-Industrial <coughs> Affect, and it's, it's you know, a working class that still calls on the memory of a period between, say, 1946 and 1973, mm -hmm. where it was vital to American capitalism and to the state that we have a healthy working class that was moving into the middle class, that was consuming the goods that were largely produced within our system. And I'm saying that that memory, that you can go out on the street and you can hold up a sign, and this is a local example from Indiana, you can hold up a sign that says GE lies, General Electric lies, and that still has some meaning. Um, I think in 1957, GE lies would have some meaning in our public sphere. I think today it's just even understood that GE, not only does GE lie, it doesn't care that it <laughs> lies. Um, cause it, because essentially it doesn't turn its profit through the exploitation of its workers. It turns its profit through financialization, through global financial markets and instruments that are developed by financial specialists, and they dabble in the making of products, and they dabble in the exploitation of workers, but their main thing is to be a participant in the global economy that that kind of post-industrial affect has no kind of real effect on. So to, to stage a protest in those terms um, is, is, is less and less effective today because of... So I was thinking of post-artisanal uh, post affect, which I'm... Well, I just, in this go ahead, context, go ahead. What, do you, what do you make of Occupy Wall Street? Um, um, I, Raucous I, laughter from I, the crowd. I, I, I gave, I gave a, a talk to the Occupy people and I reminded them, or I presented the information to them, that in almost every single major, major downturn in American and New York history, there have been movements of organized or unorganized workers, usually organized, uh, that had been demanding state intervention on behalf of the people who are unemployed. If, in fact, private capital can't hire people, then the states were duteous to step in. In 1808, we had this. In 1857, German socialists were literally camped out on the doorstep of banks on Wall Street. Uh, in 1873, there were these demonstrations suppressed, admittedly, uh, in Tompkins Square Park in 1930. Uh, uh, huge demonstrations. Um, which had something to do with the New Deal becoming a politically possible uh, 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 entity. Uh, and they said, wow, awesome. We have a tradition and we didn't even know we did. Uh, you wonder if things travel through capillaries and all of that or whether you get down to a certain point and, and I think what o, OWS was about was taking a stance that suggested there is, in fact, an alternate moral economic universe. It was a moral economy they were talking about. Uh, one of the scariest things in the financialization binge was the uh, erasure of usury. The 
usually the, the notion that there was some level of interest that you could charge for credit cards uh, was, a, was abolished. It was an unthinkable thought. There's no moral purchase point. The market dictates all, and that's in general good. I mean, you had a bit on OWS mm -hmm. uh, where you talked about really the insufficiencies of their notion of class. I mean, the 1%, the 99% mm -hmm. is, you know, on the one hand, compelling in the street. Uh, right, well, and one needs those kinds of solidarities that are pragmatic in the moment, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, but I think it, it's also, if you don't have a critical concept, a, a self-critique, an active self-critique, which I think to, you know, Occupy Wall Street's credit, uh, many, of, many of the participants in, in those organizations did have a capacity for self-critique. Mm -hmm. Um, it, of course, created fissures within uh, various organizations. But I think, you know, I would be loath to, to uh, mock a group of young people or dismiss a group of young people who are actually actively engaged in protesting the moral inadequacy of contemporary neoliberal capitalism and financialization. And I think, moreover, in as much as they don't have a sense of their historical forebears, it may have something to do with the fact that they're not spending any of their time in class because they got to work part-time jobs to pay their fucking student debt. <laughs> Excuse my language. Um, but student debt is one of the major issues that may wind up actually yeah. galvanizing real young pro youth movements of protest today in a way that, you know, I mean, you think about the reasons that, the reasons for that left activism in the moment of the progressive era on the left of the progressives. Um, they were ideological and they were material, right? The working class today in the United States, I mean, to be poor in the United States today is awful. It is not a pleasant experience. And yet, we have systems that are generating wealth from these people in ways that allow them to purchase goods through easy credit. Right? You have a militarized police force that is unequivocally on the side of capital mm -hmm. in a way that it was not in the progressive era, or certainly not uniformly, and there was no comparability in terms of the, the firepower, the manpower of these forces to repress organized activism and certainly violent activism. Mm -hmm. And I think in those respects, envisioning a robust left that imagines an alternative to capitalism, a true alternative to, to neoliberal capitalist systems of production, is much more difficult in this post-Cold War moment. On the other hand, I wonder whether or not Occupy Wall Street would have been able to happen before the end of the Cold War. Um, and I think in that kind of charged environment, probably not. So maybe we're seeing the reemergence, uh, the recrudescence of some kind of left in our own moment, but we're only at the very beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just engaged in a in a what I thought was an interesting exchange about the post eighteen seventy three period and the notion of the artisan and and the moral economy of the artisan republic and wondering um, if OWS contained a component of that and and most of the participants didn't even know it um, I because I I believe that their notion of a fair economy and of a, and of a just economy was more of a collective moral uh, notion than the pure artisanal republic, which was in part based on the, on the, 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 the lone artisan, the individual, but also had that kind of Skidmorean element where mm -hmm. it said, you know, no, we need the, the state to step in and divide the land equally amongst everybody so that everybody has their chance to gain their competence. And I think that, the, that largely that aspect of uh, at least labor activism has become very conservative, that it's about the atomized individual gaining new skills. But I think OWS did contain a component of that uh, in its anti-statism, oddly, that, that, that individuals should be allowed to flourish without either the exploitation of capital or the oppression of the state. And I, but I'm not sure, I think the, the, the political problem was nobody suggested a way to get to that other than through pure protest and, and pure oppositionalism. So I don't know if that makes sense. It, um, it does, it does, and it made me think, I mean, I was just thinking as you were talking also about what did OWS accomplish with their, with their protests and the visibility and the rhetoric, the vocabulary of inequality that they, that they promoted. I think there's, I mean, you know, maybe this is a, a provocation, but I think there's a real possibility that we could have President Romney right now if it weren't for OWS. 
because the election in some sense hinged on his comment about the 47 percent, which fit directly into this rhetoric of the 99 percent versus the 1 percent that had been in effect created and popularized by Occupy Wall Street. Well, almost the first day after the first major demonstrations in New York, Obama was on the speaker mm -hmm. uh, and talking inequality. Right. So to the degree that it puts a moral economic issue on the agenda, mm -hmm. uh, that's a tremendous and indispensable ground level. Right. And that's that the kind of dynamic you were describing about the left on the, in the progressive era, right? People who were not actually in real positions of power affecting the discourse of those who were. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what OWS is given credit for, for putting inequality on the political map. But was it that, or was it the fact that the 1% simply crushed the movement and made inequality even worse, and that's why we're being forced to talk about it? But still, no, I agree that that, that was it. So uh, either of you have um, questions you want to put to the other, or some follow-up, uh, or do we we're kind of go directly to the folks. I'd be happy to engage the crowd. Um, okay, crowd, uh, uh, over to you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, you. We, we don't have mics, I'm afraid, so if you bellow uh, as best you can. Um, I, I don't know much about the aspirational architecture of school buildings during the progressive era. Um, what I was um, mostly interested in space and, and taking space seriously was how the built environment reflects back on the population and then that kind of alters the way that they take political action. Um, I did not do a lot of research on educational buildings, unfortunately, but if, if we're going to talk about successes and failures, uh, one of the things, one of the works that I worked off of was uh, Bob Beauregard's book, uh, where he talks about how neighborhoods acquire a reputation. And I think that's one of the things that happened in Hell's Kitchen. And this does actually speak to the population, where one of the things that I noted, and I did a lot of archival work with the major newspapers of the area and how they covered Hell's Kitchen during the period. And one of the things that you see shifting during that period is as the deterioration of the physical built environment gets worse, it brings more attention from the reformers to the area, which in turn affects the way that local residents, particularly young residents, start to perform their roles as this kind of population that knows it's being studied, that knows if it does certain things, it's going to get certain things. It's, if it does certain acts, it's going to get certain types of services. So getting a clubhouse for athletics uh, was about performing the urchin in the street. Right? So if you don't do this, we're going to be out here in the street and we're going to throw rocks at your car when you come driving through in your automobile, in your newfangled mm -hmm. automobile. So it was that self-awareness of the population as an object of study that kind of changes their political habits and their political actions during the period. And on, on successes and failures, I, I, I'm glad you brought it up at the beginning. I just wanted to talk about a couple of them, uh, like DeWitt Clinton Park. DeWitt Clinton Park takes 30 years to get built. It gets built in the area, and then 30 years later, they start tearing it apart to take uh, stones from it to build the West Side Highway. So they, and they cut part of the property off from it, uh, yet it's still there. And it's still there, and it's being run by a neighborhood association. It's no longer, I mean, it gets some city funding, but it's a neglected park being run by a neighborhood association. That has to be considered a success long term, because it brought that neighborhood association together. Um, the, the other one, um, that I wanted to talk about as a, 
as a success failure. Actually, I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it. There. Did that? I know that didn't get to your question on school architecture, but it's actually not something I. You know, studied. this isn't necessarily about school architecture either, but it does have to do with space in schools. One of the successes that I came across was, uh, you know, it was a, really an initiative, and this speaks also to um, your point, Joe, about listening to the object of one's reform. Um, it, it is always, I think, in the research that I did, an element of a successful effort, or at least a partially successful reform effort, if there is real engagement with, uh, on the part of wealthy reformers or bourgeois reformers with working class populations in talking with them and asking them, what do you actually need, rather than assuming that they know and attempting to prescribe it. And uh, one instance of this was Lillian Wald actually coming up with the idea of uh, school study halls for, you know, pushing the city to create school study halls in public schools because tenement kids did not have space to actually do their homework after school because they would go home and they would be in the midst of a, a production system in their, in their tenements or their, uh, you know, siblings would be just running amok in the house and they wouldn't actually be able to do any of their schoolwork. And she learned this from residents of the Lower East Side who, you know, kids who actually told her, I'm trying to be a good boy, I'm trying to do my work, but I can't do it at home. And she advocated for this, and study halls actually became a regular, a regular space within New York City schools. And I think... Mm. Right. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when in New York State, uh, it's definitely the tipping point in mm -hmm. the 1990s and 90s. But aside from that, in terms of all the things we talked about, uh, thanks for the, the tin ear of the rich women in that movie. <laughs> it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I want to say that I think of it as a success because it had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, what happened to the women who were in it, and all the kids we talked about, is that they would go to neighborhoods their mothers never would have gone to. Mm -hmm. You know, and set up soapboxes on the Lower East Side or Bad Gang Avenue in the Bronx. And I think you can see in our state's history that those women really become different women. Mm -hmm. that they have broader, more democratic. Francis Perkins is, is a single person example, but I mean for a whole population, a very large population of women mm -hmm. who learned about the other <laughs> in the suffrage movement and mm -hmm. carried it, whatever it became, an individual and civic life after that, I can see that as a it, but just on right next door to that issue is the birth control struggle. And it's an interesting question as to whether, in fact, it's a progressive uh, issue at all. If the progressives weren't the people who tended to be backing the social purity, let's go with continents, let's be a little careful about, you know, the eruption of women. Um, it's part of the fuzz and, fuzziness of the term progressive, right? Is that yes. you, you know, you Well, have... also, I mean, Sanger uh, and Emma Goldman are the key players, and they're both working through the IWW and the Socialist Party. And that's the network that, in fact, expands it. It changes. Sanger, in fact, switches to a different politics. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it's a radical thrust that's, in fact, pushing on the progressives who are more interested in very cautious, and they can live with suffrage, but it's trickier to do birth control. But let's let's move on, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> One quick comment about space and then a question for you, David. The comment about space is, if you read um, the lightweight papers like The Call, mm -hmm. that period, as well as then Moments of Mother Earth, it's fascinating how often Madison Square Garden gets used as a site mm -hmm. for big, major rallies and meetings. I right. mean, that, it's extraordinary to think that that could happen now. You know, you think of uh, Dolan allowing Madison Square Garden to be used as a place labor organizers are getting together with the Socialist Party at the meeting. Um, First, you'd have to find a few thousand workers that wanted to actually gather in Madison Square Garden <laughs> Maybe at the there'll same be a time. silk strike in Patterson. <laughs> right. Or, you know. <laughs> but yes, point taken. Yeah, and then the question I have is just kind of overall macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
colleague, mm-hmm. despite the political reforms which were attending empowerment of the low income workers and people in general, mm-hmm. the actual income inequality didn't really change relative to what's considered the beginning of the progressive era until World War One when the political pieces were over. Mm-hmm. Um, can you speak to that at all in terms of New York City as far as the overall kind of economic climate and inequality in general? Uh, I, in terms of the nuts and bolts of the levels of income inequality in New York City, I can't necessarily, though I would suspect that New York, given that it's the sort of, yeah, it's the, it's the preferred living space of a disproportionate number of the country's industrialists and millionaires, um, I would imagine that it follows the, if anything, it's even more exacerbated than the general trend in the nation, which is, uh, you know, the first figure in Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century demonstrates this massive growth in uh, income inequality between it, it, just stretching directly across the period of the progressive era all the way to the stock market crash of 1929. So when we think about the progressive era in strictly economic terms, in terms of levels of income inequality, it's important to recognize this was a period of increasing material inequality. Now, it may be that uh, folks, it, it, not only may it be, it certainly was that in many ways uh, working class lives were improving in material terms um, or could see improvements in material terms. Public health, uh, levels of pay, the, abil- the ability to make use of public transportation systems to move out of densely inhabited urban areas that were underserved by the municipal government. There are all sorts of ways in which people's lives are improving. But at the same time, inequality is growing wider. And I think that is... That is the point that I really want to hammer home in some ways with the book to the folks who would imagine that a new progressive era will address inequality in our own, in our own time, because it didn't then, so why would it now? Lacking the macroeconomic numbers, um, I think you know, most historians see the period of 1914 to 1918 as the interruption of war production, but if you look at 1919, uh, there's certainly no solving of the of the economic problem of the urban poor. 1919 is one of the most violent years uh, in American history for rent strikes, for strikes in general, the the first Red Scare, the suppression of the left. So I think we can say by that, by the just by that standard, what, what's that? And, and like yeah, of course. So I think by and the 1920s certainly did not roar for the New York's working people. And there's a real parallel actually between 1919 and 1946 in terms of of uh, the ways in which war production mechanisms put in place by the federal government actually yes. put pressure downward on workers during the war in patriotic terms to accept uh, lower wage scales, but also offered a structure by which they could actually register their grievances uh, with a state power. And after the war ends, um, workers see that they're released in some way from uh, the patriotic constraints of wartime and are able actually to protest the conditions that they were experiencing during the war under with that system of potential state support. Um, One of the, the things about 1919 and the war more generally is the remarkable viciousness uh, of elites Mm-hmm. who had, in fact, been talking moderate, had been talking right. welfare capitalism. Now it's, let's line these bastards up against the wall and right. shoot them. I mean, Ralph Easley. there are the dozens of, the of yeah. shoot yeah. them yeah. against right. the wall quotes uh, right. from very previously modest uh, persons. So some of this is obviously the Bolshevik Revolution, which mm-hmm. is now making the dire possible consequences of uh, not checking this, but it's also the accumulated fury at the changes that in fact had been encompassed in the previous few years, uh, and the opportunity now to roll them back. Masses kaput, Socialist Party, finito. Mm -hmm. Uh, You just decapitate uh, virtually all of the organizations that have been pushing for transformation. I think it's important to remember, though, that that's in part a reaction to the levels of increasing violence during during the war. Labor violence from 1877 all the way up to and through the war, uh, you have a level of sort of, and this is something that I try to talk about a little bit in, in the book, there are terrorists blowing things up in New York City. 
uh, on a pretty regular basis, amazingly enough. I mean, through World War I, you have the bombing of the, of the Black Tom, you have the bombing that I talk about in the rapid transit strike of 1916. I mean, it's a small one, but they set a dynamite bomb on the tracks of the Lenox and 110th subway station. And in and, one of the construction strikes, it does seem that there was a nearly executed plan to blow up the 57th Street Bridge. Exactly. Uh, so you have these kind of this sense on the part of the powers that be that it, we okay time has come to rein this in. We've we've countenanced it for too long. This kind of violent organization or industrial organization on the part of the workers, and certainly one of the leaders in that regard is a man, a very young man named J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, I believe course. plays a principal role in doing similar things over the rest of the course of the 20th century. August Belmont too. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, um, that's a beautiful question, and and um, I, I think that we have to be really careful, particularly as as urban theorists and urban sociologists, on uh, on top of the history, to not over romanticize those spaces and say, oh, that's the organic space of the people, and isn't it wonderful? It was also, you know, there was Ophel sitting in the middle of the street on Eleventh Avenue. You know, it was gross, um, <laughs> but it was also usable, and it was usable in the way that people. Uh, you know, did used it because they had to mostly. Um, but in, in I hate to do this in chapter two. Um, <laughs> chapter two is all about visibility, and it's all about um, the vis the lessons of urban visibility that were gleaned from Victorian reformers, brought across the ocean, and put into American cities. That if you could see people, they would act properly, and it was certainly part of. Um, I actually do this comparison of the existing tenement system and the model tenement system that the reformers were suggesting. And you could, you could see in their drawings, they're obsessed with being able to see through the areas so that everybody's exposed, everybody's watching everybody else, and there's no, and there's no small spaces for those kind of intimacies because those intimacies don't fit with um, the urban reformers' idea of what a proper citizen is. So absolutely, they were on purpose and intentional. To destroy, but I don't know if the if the Dewitt Clinton Park plan was about destroying that uh, Lovers Lane. I have no evidence of it. It actually probably was. And it, it was probably people knew about it. The reformers knew about it. They would have been down there with their clipboards and their high collars, going, "Look at those people in that." You know. So yeah, definitely. So great question. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm a high school history teacher, and every time I come to hear people talk, I always get very frustrated because. The people up on stage spend a lot of time wanting to debunk what I'm trying to bomb. I'm trying to debunk it. 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 It was really not about helping poor people and, and sort of the working mm. class people. It really was about white middle class people trying to preserve what they they thought that they had gotten. And they sort of saw the big business was taken away from them. And that really was a maintenance issue. Mm. And I'm not quite hearing that in your discussion. Maybe it's just because 
everyone knows that it's assumed that you're sort of moving on that. But I just, is that something that we can say with, with some degree of accuracy that it's in there? Because you probably have, you know, it doesn't really affect African Americans and sort of, it's sort of white middle class people trying to hold on to white middle class people. What doesn't really affect African Americans? The progressive movement. We sort of talk about it. It's sort of a white middle class thing. It's sort of all separate. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, what, what I hear in your question in terms of the sort of status anxiety of white middle class folks who are worried about, uh, you know, centralization of corporate power and resistance to it is uh, Richard Hofstadter, The Age of Reform, uh, which is still, for good reason, a classic kind of interpretation of the progressive era in many ways, but also has been written against for a long time. It was written in 1955. And in terms of the, I think, part of what, the frustration you may be feeling is shared on stage uh, and by every historian of the progressive era, um, and it has to do with the multiplicity of the nature of the progressive era. The people who were advocating the institution of Jim Crow in the South were progressives, and they were part of the progressive era. That is how the progressive era affects African Americans, actually, is the consolidation of Jim Crow across particularly the urban South. Um, so I think that one of the things that you you wind up struggling with is how to define progressives. And it's hard to ask that question of high schoolers who don't have enough of a background in, in the general substance of the history to, to make an informed decision on it. I, I forgot my Seinfeld moment during my opening remarks when I was saying, like, this is not a history of progressive reformers. This is not this, and it's not dusty old letters. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, that, <laughs> that established history of the progressive era really needs to be taught, and people need to, I, I think students particularly, really need to understand that. But, but, it, but you're right that the, the frustration of calling anything an error and saying we could define it as beginning here and ending here uh, is extremely frustrating for everybody involved. So the Pacific Northwest had its own progressive era, and, and, it, and a lot of it involved lumber camps. Mm -hmm. How does that you know, treatment of lumber camps translate to talking about the establishment of Jim Crow right. in South Carolina. So, but then- Or the, the romance places, with, with uh, eugenics or- Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I understand your frustration. I'm sorry if we've added to it. <laughs> or, the, or the many accomplishments of women. I wanna actually yeah. you know, uh, uh, come back to this. I think that women are responsible for practically everything good that came out of the progressive era. And I, I was gonna say social reformers learned a lot too um, during that period. So, yeah, you, you've taken it on. Uh, I, <laughs> As I was wondering, as you were talking, a lot of about you know, labor activists and another you know, change coming up from the bottom, and I'm wondering if the term progressive era is it sort of what does this disservice, and, and you can't go back and change that now, so it's what we call it. But I mean, it's a confrontation with a certain stage of industrial capitalism that rose at the turn of the 20th century through a variety of ways. Including these, you know, this paternalistic social science driven approach of capital P progressives. But I wonder if what we're hearing is that the most effective change or wasn't necessarily from that group of capital P progressives or the most lasting legacy is it from them. And so trying to get back to that, like, you know, since we don't like the term liberal or mm. accepting or we'll call ourselves progressive, but that's like, Problem is, you know, summarizing this confrontation with the stage of industrial capitalism and ameliorating those inequalities by calling it progressive. I'm trying to get to a question here. <laughs> is that does that sort of summarize what I've been hearing from the result of your scholarship and thinking on this? Um. I, I think that there, I mean, there's a reason why we call it the progressive era, um, and I'm thinking of. The, the importation of social science knowledge from, say, the, you know, the German academic system that begins in the 1870s and the 1880s, uh, crosses the Atlantic, Atlantic Crossings, one of the, one of the great books about the early beginnings of these, uh, intellectual ideas about reforming American cities. And then one of the things I'm fascinated with, and so, and so the idea is, that we have a model, whether it's right or wrong, we have a model that we can work with. It's about progress based on scientific observation and method. And if we apply it not only to Philadelphia, 
but to colonial cities as well. We count the people, we understand what they do for a living, we understand what ethnic or tribal group they belong to, we divide their politics in that way. We can reach a point where we can apply our scientific knowledge in a progressive way that's gonna create something that we recognize as progress. So I think there is a reason for using the term. And now the reason, of course, as you mentioned, that we reapply that term now to our left politics is nobody wants to be a liberal, right? Um, so, because it's become or such a Marxist. Marxist. But, but there is a reason for using the progressive era, and I think that, that you can trace, and, it, and it's been done, it's been done very well, tracing that intellectual history about the idea and concept of progress that, again, is not just in American cities, but it's, it's in the colonial world as well. I'm going to go ahead and say that I'd be perfectly happy if we discarded the label progressive era entirely, <laughs> and I think, I think uh, uh, Steve I, Fraser does so in his I book. I confess that I do not use uh -huh. the terminology. I do talk about self-defined progressives to the degree that there are people who adopt uh, uh, the term that's an imp you have to understand that and this you know is is part of that effort but to speak of the progressive era i've pulled the ripcord and bailed out on that one <laughs> and speaking of bailing out um it's time to depart but don't forget that outdoors will await a little pile of books that you can purchase at a severely discounted price. And I'm sure that we can get the authors to perch out there and scribble something appropriate in the 